Hello, I am Michael Gaucher and I am building an RSS reader application on Microsoft Windows using c .net, and it's going to connect to an SQL Server backend. This program is defined in my mind according to a process I've used since the early 2000s. Software Development Lifecycle, SDLC. The information technology field, software development field, they have all these acronyms. I know a lot of them, but all these acronyms and many of the acronyms mean the exact same thing. Um, that's one of the, I guess, vibrant aspects of information technology. There's so much creativity, understanding, discovery, exploration, and research that I, new things, but I won't completely say new things are being spun out all the time. And sometimes a shortcut is taken where what existed before is not found out. Or, or let me say that sometimes people don't go and look to see if what they're trying to discover or uncover has already been accomplished by earlier researchers. People who have either struggled through difficult questions in academia or in industry. And it, some, it is sometimes more convenient to have an, a thought, an idea in your head. And due to a lack of information, see it as your own, your own idea, your own insight. Aha, Eureka. We live in a time where Eureka those unique Eureka moments, a, a great number of them in the structure of computer science and computer technology has already occurred. And when I say SDLC, there are other terms for that now. There are other terms for that, but um, I know it as the software development life cycle. And so software development life cycle classically exists in seven steps, right? And so the classic steps are um, requirements. What are your requirements? And, and in requirements, you have um, the identification of your problem and what do you need to solve that problem? You're solving the problem through software, through a system, right? And so you have to work through the requirements. And so that's the second part of that process analysis. So you need to analyze the requirements. What are the requirements for this program, for the system? What is that major problem we're trying to solve? And then analyze the requirements to see what are your dependencies to know what you're going to need, understand uh, what are the conflicts that you, in, you can encounter? What are the uh, show stopping bugs that could develop? What are the deployment issues that might arise? And then you can get so far into this analysis process that um, your requirements have to, you have to bifurcate your requirements into uh, technical requirements and functional requirements. Um, or you might go into, um, you know, um, up to four different classes of requirements, business requirements, technical requirements, functional requirements, architectural requirements. You know, you could, you know, the, there's a point where you become an architectural at architecture astronaut and you could in the in in requirements in a business analysis way and you have you know you, you, you over engineer the requirements process but it's it, no matter how you go about it it's also it's it's vitally crucial to understand your problem define it document it work through it work through it until you understand what it is you're trying to solve and, and in a general sense, maybe not in a very detailed sense, in a very general sense, how you intend to go about solving the problem. And then when we talk about solving the problem, we need to design a solution before we actually code a solution. You could say design is a synthesis of planning and requirements and analysis. It's a synthesis of those things. And so requirements and analysis are your prerequisites to design. And then 
planning is what you do so that you understand what are going to be those tangible concrete steps you're going to take to implement and apply the design, right? And planning can take a variety of forms. You can do project plans, you can use Gantt charts, you can uh, draw from official formal project management, PBOC, project management body of work. You can go as far as that, or you can go as simple as, you know, these are your time frames, these are your milestones, and you can go somewhere in between that with a more agile approach, right? You can use agile, um, which I see as more of a, of a balance between the more um, intense, intricate project management execution approach and the very ad hoc, informal, intuitive planning approach, right? And Agile, I put on the same level as the waterfall process, right, when it comes to planning. But uh, finally, you get to the one aspect of software development you must absolutely do. People can, um, can skimp on requirements, analysis, design, and planning. It happens a lot. But one thing you got to do is when you got to build an airplane, you got to build the airplane. You can't avoid the airplane. You have to build the airplane. Okay? And your software program, it's an airplane of sorts, right? You can use a different metaphor. It's a house. It's a place of dwelling. Whatever metaphor you use, you're constructing an experience. You're constructing a, a virtual process that has a tangible reaction from people and other machines. And so the discussions that we've had prior to this, whether we're talking about data conversion or after this, where we're talking about the user interface, um, we are essentially talking about prerequisites, you know, in the earlier conversations and then we're talking about construction when we are looking at building a conversion program, but that's also part of our planning and our prerequisite for our user interface. And then with our user interface, we're uh, definitely in building the program. We're definitely in that construction process. But then throughout this process, you need to do testing. And testing is where the rubber meets the road. If you don't have a testing process, if you don't have a testing uh, mentality, um, you will fail. It, I will say this, anybody can write code and anybody can say what they want, they want to have done, right? Anybody can come up with requirements. But inadequate testing posture and a reticence to test is the reason behind not only uh, catastrophic failures in software projects and software project planning, but it even shows up in very acute ways. This is controversial to say, but all those frequent updates that you get through the app stores, through the operating systems and whatnot, I'm talking about their frequency as well as the volume, the, 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 the hundreds of megabytes, and in some cases gigabytes of data you have to download. Is a symptom of um, some testing that was missed uh, in an earlier incarnation of the program. Um, we're all guilty of that. I am definitely guilty of that. But self-awareness is where you try to reach a point where you um, strive to improve through your testing methodology to narrow the amount and impact of defects. And you apply that not only to the software that you're building, you apply that to the requirements you develop, the analysis that uh, approach that you take, as well as deployment. And deployment is our final step. So in that classic SDLC uh, process, uh, deployment is where you take the program that you've built and you're, you're very sure through your validation that the program does what it's supposed to, works the way you expect it to, and you now use mechanisms to deliver that software out to people through app stores, through package uh, 
through package management systems. Package management is, uh, systems is my favorite means of deployment, by the way. I, I wouldn't mind app stores, but I like package management systems. But through package management systems, um, uh, through download links uh, on a website, um, for example, Microsoft.net has a facility called Click Once Deployment for GUI applications. And, you can, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a GUI application, but it's pre predominantly used with GUI applications. Uh, Click Once Deployment is where um, you set up a, a website page portal and there's a link. And when a person clicks on that link, uh, .NET integrated with Internet Explorer or Microsoft Edge, right, will then invoke Click Once and bring that desktop program into the, the uh, local app data and local temp directories uh, on a person's Windows computer so that that program can uh, then execute. So then when you publish an update to the web server where you hosted the, that's, that desktop program, the actual uh, files for it, then next time that person launches the program, it sees that a new version is available on the server and it automatically downloads that new version. That's how auto update has been done with .NET Windows Forms and .NET WPF programs for the longest time. I don't know if MAUI, um, Microsoft's new framework for GUI applications, um, it's, that, it's their platform that's going to allow you to write a GUI application for uh, multiple operating systems. Don't know if it will have a facility for auto update, uh, automated deployment through a web server. But um, deployment is a, is a huge topic and that's where you end up with the um, intersection of IT, systems administration, network administration, so on and so forth, uh, server management, DevOps, right? And then software development, defining the software, what it's its requirements, its runtime requirements, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then, you know, the policies that are in place for security reasons and other reasons to run a program. And so that's the classic SDLC. Uh, Steve McConnell, has written a wonderful book called Code Complete. Um, I've read both editions, and um, I think I liked the first edition more than the second edition, but the second edition is really good. It's really good. And it describes this uh, software development lifecycle uh, process. So if you want to learn more about the actual structured process for software development, uh, that's a good place to start. But like I said, the terms change over time and there are um, pre present day uh, published information that describes what I just said um, in various forms, uh, terminology, wording, what have you. So given the size of this program that um, I'm writing, this RSS reader on Windows, I don't go full out with a requirements document or anything like that. I've already gone through that process. I did that with a Linux-based program, but I took a simplified approach here with requirements, and I simply used a mock-up. I got a rectangular mock-up as a PNG file. It shows what the program looks like, its output, at least the Linux uh, version, and I'm simply gonna recreate a program, create a program that looks just like that. I don't need to know anything at all about the Linux version of the program. I don't need to know anything at all about the Linux version of the program. I don't need to know C++. I don't, need to, I don't even need to know SQLite. Let's assume that somebody else wrote that data conversion program. I don't need to know SQLite. What I need to know for this process is C Sharp, WPF, how to operate Microsoft Visual Studio, and how to operate SQL Server Management Studio and how to work with an SQL Server database. Those are the only things I need to know for this process. So, with that in mind, that's a overview of the process that I follow mentally to build programs, that structure that I follow, and we're going to use that in, in an implicit way in this process, um, from requirements to analysis to design, to planning, to building and constructing the program, testing it, and then deploying it. You 
can design and implement a user interface in a few ways. I know of about three to five different ways to build requirements and design a user interface. I'm going to create a user interface the way I want. I will write code to achieve a UI based on a screenshot picture of a program that I had previously built in the Linux environment. The first step here is to immerse myself in Visual Studio so I can have the mindset necessary to adapt this vision to Microsoft Windows using software code. I am going to do something different here than I did in my other videos, C++, the basic way, 2020. Instead of using the command line for software code, for editing and debugging code, for compiling code, and for interacting with GitHub, I will iterate a window class to match the screenshot of the similar program I built in the Linux environment. Success in this process does not require knowledge of C++ or SQL Lite or Linux skills. I am going to use C Sharp and SQL Server skills to achieve the vision. Notice that we are in a file mainwindow.xaml and we have opened it in the Visual Studio Visual Designer. The Visual St Designer is like a PowerPoint presentation designer where you can put things, lay them out on a screen, and when you run it as a program, it will look the same way. That's called WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. I'm going to modify the Visual Studio window so that it emphasizes XAML markup. Also recall from the second video where we made adjustments to the window to fit our preferences using XAML markup. It is my opinion this lets us better control the details of the user interface. I will use the root underscore content name for the stack panel on line 14 in the XAML uh, declaration. When I uh, do the reader underscore button uh, instance of a button class on line 23. But first, I'm going to set the WPF project as the startup project in Visual Studio. So whenever we click the start button at the top, the WPF uh, project and not the data conversion project runs. So this reader underscore button, um, that's going to be an instance of a button class that I will then affiliate with the root underscore content uh, ID for the stack panel. And so when we run the program, you will see nothing flashy or exciting at this stage. Our objective is to do a small test to ensure that when writing code, we can be confident that the Visual Studio project is properly configured and ready for expansion a la C Sharp code. As we run the program, we see a window with a button in place. The button is an important way to verify that we can add visual elements to the WPF window. Always remember your objective when applying requirements to the software program you are building. So we made a visual snapshot of the program and that's going to serve us extremely well. This is our requirements document. Requirements documents can come in different forms, right? we've chosen a form of a visual image, a graphical image. If we take a good look at this screenshot, 
We have tabs in the upper left hand corner. We have a list of headlines on the left side and we have all the content on the right. The objective then is to take this essentially blank canvas and transform it into the screenshot we just looked at it. And so we will have tabs in the upper left hand corner. We will have headlines listed down the left hand side and we'll have article content on the right hand side so that when we click on a tab the relevant headlines will show on the on the left hand side and when we click on a headline the relevant article content will show up on the right hand side sounds simple but it will require attention to detail in the code that we write we could do all of this right now Simply add a visual element that presents tabs, headlines, and article content. It would be fake, but it would be a very quick way to set up the user interface. That is a legitimate way to go, but I would like to generate the user interface from actual data from a database from the start. To that end, I am adding an entry in the settings file that will have the database connection string that goes to the local SQL server where we imported data from the SQLite database in videos uh, three through six. I'll use this connection string through the SQL server ADO provider in .NET to bring in the data needed to generate the user interface. I will access the SQL server database to bring back the list of feeds and their associated headlines and articles. A for loop will be instrumental in generating tabs at the upper left corner of the screen. Automatic data binding will be used to generate a list of headlines. We need the right visual classes from the WPF framework to make this happen. Documentation is the answer and Microsoft has that covered with the help viewer. The help viewer program lets us download offline copies of the official Microsoft documentation for .NET. Real-time access to the internet is great for many things, but for very quick answers such as what methods and interfaces are involved to write a user interface for example, a tool like help viewer is faster once you know the overall concepts. I generally, let's say greater than 80% of the time, will not pursue a software development endeavor unless I am sure about the documentation. Minimizes running around in circles. I love offline documentation, whether as PDFs, printed books, ebooks, or through a tool like Help Viewer in that order. In the next video, we will set up Help Viewer so we have the right reference to know which classes to use from WPF to build the user interface.